Um, this is Kelly Michalko, and I'm speaking with Mr. Ealing Kramer, former, former MLA for the North Battleford area. And we're speaking at his home, or his cottage, at Jack Fish Lake on Delorme's Beach. And how are you today, Mr. Kramer? I'm uh, fine, fine, Kelly, and just, just dandy. It's a beautiful day, and uh, uh, the only thing that uh, that's wrong with a beautiful day like this, it's awfully dry up here and not very good for grass and crops. Well, I think what we'll do is we'll start with a bit of your family life, your early family life, and where your parents came from, and move into a bit of your early life. So if you'd like to start with that. Well, my dad came from the Netherlands, Holland, in 1905. He uh, homesteaded in what is known, as is known now as the Highworth District, about uh, four miles south of Round Hill, where my present ranch is. And uh, he also uh, worked as a steel uh, tool hardener, blacksmithing steel erection on uh, the bridges at Elbow, Saskatchewan, and the one, the railroad bridge, that is now west of Battleford, between Battleford and Highgate, uh, when that was before North Battleford uh, was a, even a town. The, uh, the railroad, as everyone knows, was, was relocated from its early planning stages from south of the river to north of the river, and uh, that was what brought North Battleford about back in the early 1900s. My mother joined Dad in 1907. Uh, they had uh, were engaged to be married before he left uh, the Netherlands, and uh, she came by boat and by train to North Battleford in 1907. Got off the train. They uh, went up to what was then a little pre Presbyterian church located almost the exact spot uh, where the building known as Kramer Place is now standing. The little church was located there. I'm not sure the exact number on that block, but it was there for years. Later became the Salvation Army Church and uh, then was moved away and uh, was taken over I think by the Elks for a while as a club hall over, over by the Greek Orthodox Church. I think later on, possibly that little church was was uh, was taken over by one of the Ukrainian organizations. I, I'm not exactly sure of that. However, they yes. Yeah. Well, your family settled it because it was the Highworth area, and I guess there's a little story attached to how that was named. Yes, there's a story attached to that when uh, when they. They settled the Highworth District. Naturally, like every district in Saskatchewan, they needed a school. And there was a, <clears throat> a ratepayers meeting to uh, to decide on whether they were going to form a school district, which was uh, was decided in the affirmative. Then they uh, they uh, proceeded with the building of the, the school and, of course, <clears throat> the naming of the school. The land was donated, you might say, by one of the homesteaders who owned the quarter section that the old Highwood Schools uh, was built on. That was a chap of the name of Lou Bundock. Lou uh, <coughs> was a bachelor, but he, um, he donated the land, his land is two acres of land, for a dollar an acre to make it legal. Actually, it was a donation. Dad uh, was fairly competent in the in the English language and uh, but at the same time he the uh, Dutch mannerism of speaking uh, put some things around in reverse and when when Lou donated his land and said he only wanted the or said he would sell it for a dollar an acre dad uh, said uh, your land is not so high worth and of course this brought a little chuckle from the rest of the Canadian, English, and so on, uh, ratepayers that were there, 
and decided they decided that that was a good name for the school, and they called it High Worth. It's mm. a good story. So your parents settled, and uh, I suppose you came along. And what year were you born? I was born in 1914. <coughs> I had an older brother and sister uh, that was uh, came along before me. I was I was four years younger than my brother Herman, who actually passed away last year. My sister is still living out in B.C. But there were three of us, and uh, we uh, we raised uh, we were raised in in the Highworth district and uh, went to school there. In fact, all my formal education was was uh, gained in that school. They used to teach from grades from one to twelve in in the uh, in the schools at that time and. Uh, I did the best I could with what I had. I, later on, I took a, a correspondence course in writing and journalism from the New York School of Journalism, and uh, the rest of my education was gained in the College of Hard Knocks. Right. Uh, do you recall any of the teachers that you might have had in the Highworth area? Yes, I, I presume I, 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 uh, I can remember most of them. The first teacher I remember was a Miss Scott, who later became Mrs. Charlie Light, who uh, was a well-known, well-known person in the, uh, in the Battleford area. He uh, was school, uh, or not school, a postmaster there for years. Um, some of his descendants are, uh, are still around the area, or around in Canada. There was one son, uh, Colin, uh, was, they were good friends of mine, were in Regina. Colin died last winter. But uh, the other sons, I believe, are, are, uh, are still around. And their two daughters, Mrs. Francis and Mrs. Florence, have been uh, well known in the Battleford. That was my first school teacher, and she spoiled me terribly. I was four years old when I started school, and I, after walking uh, nearly three miles across country with my older brother and sister, uh, I was. Uh, uh, likely to fall asleep and often woke up on Miss Scott's lap and uh, so I was uh, I had to do some fighting even at uh, four and five years old because they called me teacher's pet uh, but uh, anyway I lived through that another other teacher that came along quite soon after that was a uh, there was a Miss Jones I, I don't remember too well but a Miss Brower. Now, Miss Brower was the first wife of the late John Diefenbaker, and uh, she was a lovely lady. And uh, I've often wondered why, uh, after uh, working with John so long, that uh, and and helping him in elections and uh, and standing at his side as long as he did, why uh, so little was. Uh, said about her in uh, in most of uh, John Diefenbaker's memoirs. A few other people have written about that. I shall not go into that further, but all I can say is that uh, uh, Miss Brower was uh, just a lovely person, as I remember her. There were others after that. Uh, the ones I remember the best were in, uh, we had some male teachers. There was a Mr. Daynard, a Mr. Simmons, and uh, Mr. Cook, who was an Oxford Englishman, he, um, he was a very good teacher. He had some other idiosyncrasies that led to his dismissal uh, uh, later on. But I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, on balance, I learned a great deal uh, from, uh, from Mr. Cook. I, I remember when the other children were out, out uh, playing, uh, we, uh, I would be sitting inside uh, talking and asking questions and, and even arguing politics with, uh, with Mr. Cook at that time. I was about in, I was in grade eight about that time. So you spent, uh, I guess, your formative years on your father's farm. Yes. And um, you're near North Battleford. What, uh, was one of your first employment experiences as a young man? Well, I, other than farm work, 
uh, one of the experiences when uh, this was in late 19, about 1938-39, the uh, former, the late Chief Tom Davidson was looking for extra help when the the Air Force came to North Battleford, known as the RAF. Uh, things got a little turbulent there at times, and uh, he asked me to come in as a special constable to help keep order. Uh, this went on for two or three years sporadically, and uh, that was a that was a rather enjoyable time. Uh -huh. Who were some of the other constables along at that time? The uh, constables, the other constables, uh, the desk sergeant was a chap by the name of Frank Buckle, who is still living in Penticton. Uh, Bob Anthony uh, was uh, was another very good friend of mine. Uh, he he uh, was uh, one of the senior officers in the in the force. Uh, he has passed away. His widow Olive still lives in North Battleford. And he was one of the finest people I've I, I've ever met. There was a, a, a Cecil Dutnall, uh, Walter Rowland, who died last winter, was uh, was another constable on the force. Uh, and um, there, uh, I guess that would that would take uh, would take up the uh, side of the Chief Davidson. That would. There were others came and went. There was used to be a chap the name of Dodds was on the force, but I, he wasn't there at the time I was uh, working mm -hmm. there. What was North Battleford like that time? You were a patrolman, I suppose. You traveled the community, you know, and knew the different businesses and a lot of the people. Maybe there's some in interesting incidences that you can talk about. Well, there there were some interesting incidences. Uh, there's no doubt in incidents. I uh, I can remember we had uh, the, our our police car was a. Uh, was an old 1935, I believe, terraplane. It was called in those days. It was a, it was one of the first streamlined vehicles, and uh, it uh, by that time it was six or seven years old and not in the best condition. <clears throat> I remember we got a uh, frenzied call from the Chinese operator of the Frisco Cafe, which stands on the corner where the Capri or stood on the corner where the Capri is now, kitty corner across from the railroad station. And, and a Chinaman there was saying, big fight, big fight, come quick. So we went out and they tried to start the terraplane, which wouldn't start. Frank Buckle got into the got into the uh, driver's seat trying to start it, and they always decided to push it. Bob Anthony and myself and Cecil Dutton were all pushing the car down the street towards the Frisco Cafe. We pushed it all the way. The police car and the police arrived. Uh, <coughs> a little late, but there was a little, uh, a little uh, matey chap, slim and wiry, fighting off four or five uh, raft with a broken part of a broken chair in his hand, and he was doing a good job. He had. He had um, accounted for a couple of them who were standing back nursing some sore heads. We got that broke up, but uh, we had to walk the prisoners back <laughs> back to the, to the cells. I should ask uh, where the, the police station was at that time. police station uh, it, it stood at that time, which was part of this, also in uh, City Hall, where the OK store now stands. On uh, on 99th or what was known as King Street, and uh, in those days. Uh -huh. I suppose you gained a lot of your reputation in around this area as an auctioneer. Maybe you can talk a bit about how you got into that business. And uh... well, uh, I got into that business uh, simply by deciding I was going to become an auctioneer. Uh, Dave Taylor, who had been the auctioneer around uh, northwest this part of northwest Saskatchewan for years and years was was getting older a number of of uh, other younger fellows tried to get started they would work with Dave for uh, off and on for a year or so and then branch out on their own but I didn't do that I thought if I was going to make it I'd make it on my own and I I started out uh, by persuading 
some of the people that I could do the job, and and uh, I did the job, and obviously it was satisfactory enough to for them to uh, pass on the word, and I gradually built up the auction business to uh, not quite where it is today, because my son has expanded on the business since he took it over in the 70s, and uh, I'm very, very proud of the job Neil is doing in uh, in the auction and real estate business in this area now. I suppose uh, we can get into <clears throat> where you're very well known as your politics and your association with the CCF and later the NDP. And I suppose your parents coming from Holland, being social democrats, influenced you quite a bit. Perhaps we can talk about that and then uh, lead into your own political career from there. Yes, that's that's true. Well, my dad was a was a social democrat before he came to this country, and, and uh, there weren't weren't uh, many of those around. There were some uh, people who had uh, that social philosophy from came from Britain and uh, and other parts of the country, but uh, there were uh, a distinct minority. The uh, the traditional liberal and conservative uh, parties were around at that time, as they are today, and uh, and uh, so Dad was uh, was a bit uh, of uh, just a bit different, Dad and Mother, and uh, we um, we had an awful lot of of discussions at our home when neighbors would come to visit. And uh, there were times when uh, Dad was pretty badly ostracized during elections because uh, uh, he was not following the mainstream of either the liberal or the conservative parties, which he contended, and I still contend, uh, are no different. Uh, they, uh, they never have been. One is in and the other is out. And uh, it has always been that way and continues to be. Mm -hmm. Any particular idea that you might have picked up on as a, as a young man that uh, convinced you that this was the party for you and uh, that's something that you believed in? Well, uh, I suppose if anything uh, was needed to further convince me uh, in, in a democratic socialist philo philosophy <clears throat> was the fact that during the 30s, we had uh, we had uh, poverty right across this country in what is one of the wealthiest countries in the world and the parallels uh, are are still still true today we have an abundance of resources and uh, we uh, we fail to organize our society in a manner that can uh, uh, provide for the great mass of people that uh, that uh, is still true. Uh, we uh, we uh, hear people boasting about the the glories of free enterprise, uh, which is not free or enterprising. Uh, when the country is being run by monopolies, it was then and it is now, and I have had no reason whatever to to uh, change my mind. In fact, anything that uh, that uh, has been done has been only a, a patching and making, making life a little easier for the average person. Uh, that anything that I mean that the New Democratic Party and the CCF has done, mm -hmm. make, make it life a little easier for Canadians. And these are the things that were brought about by uh, CCF and New, Democrat, uh, New Democratic statesmen in the, in the country. Going back to Woodsworth, the first old age pensions were, were the, the creation of J.S. Woodsworth when Mackenzie King was forced to bring it in because uh, we, um, we, we had at that time, even with two members, the balance of power. Mackenzie King could not have, have uh, maintained his office back in the 20s if uh, he had not brought in the Old Age Pension Act. And uh, that went on. Those things have gone on and on and on. Unemployment insurance, a number of other things, and, uh, and uh, even to Medicare in Canada today. These have all been brought about when 
the national governments have been forced to bring these about, and mostly this has been has happened, not always, but it's been happened under liberal government, then they have, uh, they have had to bring in progressive ideas and uh, progressive uh, acts in order to maintain power. Unfortunately, uh, quite often, they bring them in and then mess them up with patronage. Right. There are a good many instances that I can name of where uh, good ideas have been ruined or, or uh, got into bad odor because of simply uh, involving too many hangers, political hangers on in the management of, uh, of good programs. Unemployment insurance is one of the, uh, of the programs uh, that have been, in my opinion, uh, spoiled uh, to some extent because they have not adhered to the original idea. I have never been able to see any good reason why, for instance, construction workers who might make thirty-five to forty thousand dollars during the construction season should be able to apply for unemployment insurance for the uh, during the winter, when the milkman, the postman, and all the people who work year-round, and they used to work for a lot less than they they do now, but even for twenty thousand a year half what the, uh, what the high-priced construction worker has earned, they are trudging around in the snow and the cold for half the money while, uh, while there uh, is drawing unemployment insurance and uh, sitting, uh, enjoying himself, watching TV. That's one. Uh, there are others, there are others, uh, such as the, <coughs> the old uh, PFRA program, which has now been, been replaced by, uh, by um, uh, crop insurance. I said PFRA, I should have said PFAA. Now that <coughs> was, was one of the old liberal pork barrels where every, uh, every rural farmer that was on the liberal executive got a job every fall inspecting uh, crop damage and uh, determining what the, what the uh, the uh, uh, crops were like, whether they qualified for uh, for uh, PFAA or not. And there was one time in the legislature where I took the Battleford Rural Executive, the list, and took the list of people who were employed by PFAA, and with only one or two exceptions, they were all the same people. Um. I suppose I should ask you now, after your your great influence of your family in uh, formulating some ideas about uh, policies and uh, politics, when you first became actively involved with the with the CCF and the circumstances that, that led to active involvement. Well, in the in the uh, late thirties, after the demise of the. Anderson government, the, the only conservative provincial government we had until the present one, uh, I was doing the things that you know, poll workers do. We, we canvassed, we collected memberships, and, uh, and uh, attended conventions uh, through the late 30s and then into the 40s. 1944, uh, we elected a government. Uh, many of us were surprised uh, at the extent of our success. After that, I uh, was active in the Battleford constituency. Uh, I became the uh, the councillor for the uh, Battlefords in '46 and '47, which is the advisory arm of the uh, of the party we still we now have two councillors in every constituency uh, a man and a woman but uh, and then in 1948 I was the campaign manager for Alec Conan who was our elected MLA at that time he had been elected in 44 he was a railroader a railroad conductor and uh, <coughs> had been active of course in the party for a number of years we also 
uh, had uh, that's, uh, we had an election at that time, and of course in '48, maybe because I was the campaign manager, we we uh, we lost that election narrowly to Paul Prince, a liberal, who died in 1950 in the winter of '50, and we had a by-election. I was the returning officer for the Battleford constituency in charge of the the election machinery and voting machinery at that time. And uh, once again, Alec Cronin was defeated uh, narrowly. Uh, the figure was, I remember very clearly, by Jim Maher was 136 votes. And uh, then in 1952, the general election, uh, I had been the I was the vice president of the SFU and a director of the Farmers Union, the Saskatchewan Farmers Union for District 16. I had resigned from the, the vice presidency because, uh, well, I couldn't afford to take the time to uh, be more involved. Uh, I <coughs> didn't uh, see eye to eye with the president at that time, who was Joe Phelps, on a number of things, and uh, there wasn't really room for both of us in the farmers union because we had we j didn't work well together. And I decided that Joe had more spend time to spend and devote to it than I did, so I thought it was best that I step out, which I did. And it wasn't long after that that uh, the Battleford's executive and uh, Mr. Conan asked me to uh, to stand as the, uh, the candidate for the Battlefords because Mr. Conan did not want to maintain the candidacy. And uh, the result was that I said yes. I was nominated. Uh, there was a three, three nominees, the late Chester Robins, uh, Robertson of Richard and uh, Jack, the late Jack Nyholt of the North Battleford uh, were the other two nominees. I won the nomination and uh, then won the election on June the 11th of, of uh, 1952, and uh, the story uh, continues from there. And the Liberal candidate would have been uh, Jim Maher at that the, time? The Liberal sitting member was Jim Maher. Mm -hmm. um, do you think he was tough competition for you at that election? Well, Jim Maher was... Uh, and I say to even today is probably, in my opinion, uh, one of the the best uh, public people in uh, in in Saskatchewan. Uh, he certainly stood head and shoulders above any both liberal members that I became acquainted with over the years. And uh, yes, he was he was tough competition, and uh, I was. Uh, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty elated when I, uh, as a, as a newcomer to politics, was able to win the, win the constituency. You won that election, and what uh, do you attribute your success to at that time? Well, I, first of all, on the basis of, uh, of uh, uh, public opinion and uh, and the program, we had eight years at that time of uh, the Douglas CCF government. When we were elected in, 19, in 1944, we were elected on a nine-point program uh, uh, with uh, outlining policies and promises that, uh, of the things we would do if we were elected. 1948, uh, the, uh, we were able to go back to the people of Saskatchewan and say that these nine planks had been thoroughly and completely carried out and present another program, which I believe at that time was a 12-point program, and uh, they were re-elected with a somewhat narrower majority, but re-elected, and uh, that program was carried out, and uh, a number of programs that are that are uh, tradition now in Saskatchewan uh, that have been very beneficial have been uh, government insurance, the beginning of our Medicare plan, uh, hospitalization was brought in at that time. There was a, 
the Farm Security Act uh, had become uh, was uh, was certainly uh, was certainly legislation unique in uh, in in Canada, which protected the family farm, uh, the home quarter, and the home from from foreclosure uh, under under any uh, when there's circumstances under circumstances beyond the farmer's control, which certainly is is pretty obvious today when farmers are going broke because of weather conditions beyond their control. Mm -hmm. All of these and many more, and uh, in this, for this conversation, I, I can't enumerate all of them, but when I ran in 52, I was able to hold up those two uh, election uh, program cards and say, here are the two, uh, the eight years, here's the result of eight years, promises made and promises kept. And that was a uh, situation that uh, had never maintained. Political platforms had, uh, had always been something to get in on and get away from as soon as you're elected, just like a railroad platform. And uh, that, uh, I think that was the, uh, uh, the strength of the party. I don't all right the uh, as I said as I, when we had that short interruption there we uh, we had the the strength of promises made promises kept and uh, even running against a, a, a strong a liberal candidate and a sitting member uh, I believe we we would have uh, won the election handily, but uh, there was another another uh, advantage that came up, uh, which was not of our creation, but certainly uh, an act of fate, I guess you'd call it. Hoof and mouth disease had broken out in Saskatchewan that year, and the liberals at Ottawa had uh, not handled things very well. There were um, there was a lot of dissatisfaction among the farmers, and uh, I believe while we we didn't exploit that uh, politically, I believe the dissatisfaction in the, in uh, among the farmers about the uh, handling of uh, the hoof and the mouth, and especially the markets, uh, the price of cattle dropped uh, by by uh, more than fifty percent. And uh, when the, the, there was a moratorium placed on the marketing of cattle right across uh, Canada, and uh, they uh, did not, the government did not uh, put in compensatory uh, programs to meet the needs, even the basic needs of farmers at that time. And I believe there was a backlash in farm areas on the, uh, concerning that, which. Uh, instead of probably maybe a, a, a narrow a narrower margin uh, we won that election the battlefords I won the election the battlefords with a majority of between six and seven hundred votes and uh, that was probably a much much better majority than it had ever been held because with the contest prior to that had been been very close 44 48 50. Uh, 44 and 48, not 52. So the 1952 victory um, sort of shot you into politics and began a career for you in politics that spanned some 29 years. And I suppose over those years you became associated with a lot of different people in the party and became involved with a lot of interesting issues. Maybe you can uh, go over a, a few of the more uh, significant issues and mention a few of the significant names of people that uh, were associated with the party and maybe even outside of the party? Well, no doubt, no doubt that uh, the, the Douglas government, either by good for fortune or, uh, or whatever, uh, brought into power uh, a number of, of people who uh, turned out to be uh, 
good administrators uh, and uh, imaginative uh, leaders uh, that uh, that were respected regardless of uh, of politics we had we had you know Tommy Douglas set aslide who was unique in his own and uh, remains unique as a political leader one of the one of the outstanding uh, most outstanding a statesman that Canada has uh, has produced, but uh, there were Brocklebank, John Brocklebank Sr., very very active in municipal affairs and uh, and uh, in uh, in resource areas. Uh, Woodrow Lloyd, who was the youngest cabinet minister ever appointed in Saskatchewan, uh, born and raised. He probably, in fact, he was the first native son ever to become premier of uh, Saskatchewan and uh, he was a he was a, a giant of intellect and is recognized as such by his peers throughout Saskatchewan mm -hmm. there were a number of others there were the sturdies uh, the Macintoshes and and uh, and uh, many others uh, Alec Kuziak he was the first Ukrainian son that uh, had ever been in cabinet uh, in uh, in Saskatchewan. Another another um, very 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 attractive, a tremendous speaker and and uh, and a tremendous politician. What about uh, people that uh, lived in the Battlefords? Maybe not right involved in the heat of things, but uh, involved with the party that you can think of offhand. Well, back going, going, going back again to the, the 30s and the early beginnings, there were, were uh, there was a nucleus before the uh, before the CCF party even was formed. There was a nucleus of uh, very progressive thinking people. We had had a uh, a little uh, a little surge of progressive thinking in an unorganized way when we elected all the progressives uh, from Western Canada, 61 of them elected in Western Canada, and actually they influenced the government of the day, but they were not a cohesive party, they were not elected on a platform, and uh, Mackenzie King was crafty enough and wily enough to, to destroy that movement by appointing a number of them to prominent jobs and positions, and and they were decimated and, and left a sense of frustration uh, in Western Canada uh, that, uh, that we still haven't, in fact, we still haven't got over that today. The CCF was formed uh, in the early 30s because we said it is no use to simply elect a bunch of people. We have to have a, uh, have a program which is, um, is cohesive, and uh, has, uh, has, this is what was done. The people who, who did that in the Battlefords, the people who were, were influential in the Battlefords were uh, uh, Dr. Goodwin, uh, late Dr. Goodwin. There was uh, another person there, Fred Conroy. Uh, uh, there was a, a Mr. Jones that uh, was uh, was very active. One of his sons uh, is still living in, in the Battlefords. The, uh, the rural people, there was, uh, I mentioned him before as a, as a nominee when, when I first stood uh, as a candidate. Jack Nyholt, uh, Wesley Lamb, Bill Lamb, his son is, is still in, in uh, we had elected some people from uh, some farmers. There was Charlie Davis was uh, was elected in, as a progressive uh, from around East Hill. Later, Sam Houston was elected as a as a provincial member. Uh, there was a real there was a real progressive um, group of thinkers uh, that uh, that uh, came to the forefront and uh, and were in those early planning stages. There were. Um, there was a Josh Graves. Uh, he was a real estate uh, salesman, was very prominent. Uh, a John Walashan, 
uh, the Voloshin family, he was one of the Voloshin family, that, uh, there's still a number of them. Uh, his son is Fred Voloshin, who is now in the regional care center. And Fred Voloshin has, has been very well known as, uh, and has been a, can a federal candidate for us. But uh, he, was, he was an active worker, and uh, his wife Gertrude is, is still uh, active and working in, in, uh, in the party. Uh, yeah. So North Battleford, we, we can say, was very active, and uh, I guess it shows just by the fact that you were MLA for 29-odd years, and the, the people there were quite supportive of you in, in the party. Um, perhaps uh, we can just get into uh, a couple of the more significant issues. Um, I think you mentioned before uh, policies regarding uh, care homes, that type of thing, um, North Battleford uh, got quite a few care, care homes in the 50s, maybe you could comment on those. Well, we, we, did, we did a number of, uh, of things. So one of the first, one of the first uh, significant things that happened in health was, uh, was a, a re, uh, was a, a a redevelopment and a ch total change in policy in uh, in mental health care at the Saskatchewan Hospital. The um, the revolution in the treatment of mental patients pretty well started uh, in uh, in uh, in in Saskatchewan, both at in North Battleford and Weyburn. The uh, the treatment of patients, which uh, was usually just custodial. Uh, with no treatment of their illness, uh, uh, there was a real turnaround, and I suppose that was the first move in 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 healthcare. The uh, the uh, when going back, I may as well start out in the areas that I was involved in in 1952. Uh, whether you whether you go into the building of uh, of uh, Hospitals. Uh, the, uh, we, we gradually can we can built extensions to our our uh, what was the former Notre Dame. Now it now it has uh, has become the Union Hospital. Uh, we continued to expand that to what was while I was still a member was uh, we added the psychiatric wing for mental uh, mental health care in there uh, but one of the one of the things that I'm I'm tremendously proud of is uh, the fact that we recognized early in Saskatchewan that we had an aging population and uh, that it was very very necessary to to do something about providing proper housing and care for, uh, for senior citizens that could no longer take care of themselves or did not have family to, uh, to care for them. We came along uh, and, and presented the, uh, the uh, housing like in North Battleford, uh, the original uh, River Heights Lodge, which has been expanded several times but, but was, um, was be begun in the late 50s. The ideas came about the late 50s. Now, <coughs> political polarization uh, was, uh, was pretty strong in, uh, in, uh, in the Battlefords, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, many of the prominent people in, in the Battlefords would, uh, would not cooperate if, uh, even though it was a good plan, if it was put forward by the government. You simply could not simply come forward with an idea and expect instant approval. Because uh, when you move in with a, with a new idea, uh, it requires tax uh, taxation. It requires uh, some, uh, some municipal participation. So the plan for, uh, for the, uh, the places like River Heights, these, these uh, Homes for senior citizens was uh, was introduced. Uh, 
I remained in the background with the plan. I persuaded uh, the Reverend Alan Logie to, to uh, head it up and uh, keep it in a neutral area politically, and uh, which resulted in, in uh, the River Heights Lodge being accepted and funded by the provincial government. The only cash funding that still goes in to these type of uh, places, whether they be our new high rises or, uh, or any of them, the only cash that goes in is uh, from the, the city and the provincial government, which is 20 percent which is, uh, is, is, a, is an outright grant. The federal government participates with mortgage, long-term mortgage assistance on a, uh, uh, with, a, with a, a reasonable interest rate. Now, uh, but we must remember this, and many people don't realize it, that the 20% cash is, is uh, if it wasn't for the 20% cash contribution, from the provincial government, and 5% uh, on behalf of the muni participating municipality, which is usually property and services. These, uh, these would never have caught on the way they did, but uh, they, uh, they were, they were and are uh, uh, landmark progressive uh, uh, legislation and, uh, and action that uh, I certainly, I certainly am, am pretty proud because I believe that any country or province uh, always should be judged on how they take care of their aged and their unfortunate, how they educate their young and take care of their aged. I believe that is the best criteria of measuring the worth of government. I suppose one of the landmark issues that uh really put the NDP uh, in the limelight was the issue of Medicare and that came up I suppose beginning in the early 60s and we can call that a I guess a hot issue and it was a hot issue in North Battleford maybe you'd like to talk a bit about that its beginnings and uh, well it was it was um, it, it I, I guess it came into <coughs> into being the final stage of, of the health improvement, health insurance, actually came into uh, in, to fruition in the early 60s. <coughs> we had been working toward that particular, particular uh, type of uh, uh, health care uh, for a number of years, since the inception of the of the early CCF. It had always been Douglas's dream and was a dream of the party that we would have full health care. Hospitalization brought in uh, in 1948 was landmark for Canada and uh, it was the uh, initial cornerstone of health care in Saskatchewan. We uh, expanded from there with a number of other things through the 50s, we established two health regions, the one in the southwest, first one, health uh, region number one. They had full Medicare in health region number one long before 1960, and it was working very well. Uh, the mistake was, if there was a mistake made in the introduction of Medicare, was that, uh, that uh, in 1960, when we fought the election on the Medicare issue, 75% of the doctor's offices and probably more were political propaganda stations fighting against the introduction of Medicare. We fought that election in 1960 and we won it with the, uh, against the united efforts of conservatives, liberals, social creditors, and the very powerful doctor's union, which is called the Medical College, and, and we won it. The problem was that Douglas and company, uh, my party, were <coughs> being too cautious and too democratic, 
And they chose then, after winning that election, and winning it well, we, we, uh, we sent a delegation to Sweden and Australia and Norway to, uh, to try to, to prove to the people that we were being, uh, we were being totally democratic in, in our approach and trying to win agreement. And that was a mis in retrospect, that was a mistake. We already had health region number one and two working well, and we should have immediately after that election, we should have uh, introduced it right across the board in Saskatchewan and not fooled around. Mm -hmm. it, was we, a, it was mistaken that it finally led to a doctor's strike. That's right. If we had, a, the doctors were beaten badly in their, in their opposition and all the other political parties, and I think one should, I want to say this and say it very clearly, it's all very well. I heard, uh, heard uh, a politician on the open line this morning, uh, Ralph Goodale, talking about the fact that all political parties support Medicare. Well, they do now because it's proven to be very successful and popular. But there was, was the, the, the conservative, liberal, or social creditor, prominent ones, that supported Medicare in those days and weren't fighting against it in the Keep Our Doctors Association were the exception that proved the rule. I know of no prominent liberal that was not actively, or conservative, in the battlefield, that was not actively fighting tooth and nail against the introduction of Medicare. And they did against the uh, back when hospitalization. It was compulsory, it was wrong. The same thing with, uh, with automobile insurance. It was because it was compulsory. Simply because we bring the magic of averages to bear, and where no one pays very much, but everyone pays their share. In, 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 in a private enterprise, in a private enterprise Medicare system, it is only the honest bill payer that pays more than his or her share. The people that are poor and can't afford to pay nothing, the people who, who uh, don't want to pay or can get out of pay nothing, the wealthy who can afford it really pay little in comparison to their income. So it is this, this small group, relatively small group, of honest bill payers, the upper middle income people and middle income people that pay the brunt of the Medicare costs in a, what is called a private, med uh, in private medicine, as they do in the States. Either that or a group of insurance companies make about twice as much as they should out of selling Medicare. Um, getting into North Battleford a little bit, uh, maybe you can talk a bit about how uh, this doctor strike and the Medicare issue uh, affected or influenced people in the Battlefords. Was it uh, a hot issue there? Were people uh, influenced by it? Well, they were influenced by it. We, uh, there's no doubt that, that uh, people were uh, became very emotional. There were people who became very afraid when, uh, when uh, their doctor would tell them, uh, look, uh, you're, uh, you're going to have, uh, well, whether they're going to have a baby or they're going to have some uh, necessary surgery, uh, we won't be here to take care of you. That is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very effective in creating very, very, a great deal of fear in, in people. I know that, uh, that a couple of doctors, we were expecting our, our youngest, who uh, just had her birthday yesterday, Jennifer, was born on the 29th of, of July, 1962. And uh, the, uh, the doctors that were taking care of Dorothy at that time said, look, uh, you're going to have a difficult birth, uh, and we won't be here to take care of you. She, um, she came home from her, her examination in May. This was in May. And uh, I, uh, I said, well, very well. And we called a doctor who had been, one, been her doctor before in Saskatchewan. In fact, I don't mind mentioning his name, Dr. Russell. He's uh, retired now and living at Metanota. I called Jim Russell and uh, I said, uh, told him what the situation was. And uh, he said, well, don't worry about it. Whenever she is, uh, is coming close to her time, 
bring her down here. She can stay at our house, and and uh, we'll use her, we'll we'll you know, admit her to the university hospital, and I'll take care of her. There was the the difference in, and uh, these were some of his former associates that were threatening her, and I call it blackmail. Uh, in uh, in uh, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the city was, I suppose, polarized. Uh, the doctors on one side, uh, supporters of Medicare on the other side. Uh, a lot of criticism, criticism flung around that type well, of thing. Well, I got I got a lot of I got a lot of phone calls in the middle of the night. My kids were were uh, threatened and and sworn at and in school. They. Uh, they, uh, I had uh, rocks thrown at my window. I had a window cracked with rocks thrown at it, and uh, <clears throat> that's uh, that's what makes me a little cynical when I hear hear people who I know were fought tooth and nail to to uh, keep Medicare from coming in now giving lip service to it. And I I, I fear that if ever if they ever thought they could get away with it, they would uh, would uh, move very quickly. To certainly put this, put Medicare back on, uh, uh, on uh, at least on a basis of uh, uh, people paying uh, for uh, a uh, at least a portion of the care, and when they do that, once again, they uh, by simply uh, putting putting a, uh, a deterrent fee on hospitals or. Uh, or a, a special fee for doctors, once again, you're getting back to where we were, where the people who can least afford it pay the most. We have that situation, uh, or at least had it, in, in, uh, in Alberta uh, and a good many places in Saskatchewan. In Ontario, uh, the average family now plays, pays $600 a year for their Medicare insurance. That means that uh, uh, a low-income person pays 600, and the millionaire pays 600. And that is unfair taxation. The fair taxation is what we have here in Saskatchewan: is that you have a 5% sales tax, which covers Medicare, education, that type of thing, at least partially covers it, and uh, they, uh, they, it comes out of general revenue. The person who buys the most. Uh, pays the most, and that is why I say based on ability to pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, moving along, the Medicare issue uh, moved into 1964, and uh, the election came up. Yep. Ross Thatcher was leader of the Liberal Party. What uh, kind of relationship do you think that issue had with the with the loss that election for the well, NDP? I believe I believe that uh, that uh, was the was the still still the the, uh, the aftermath of the emotion uh, that uh, that elected Ross Thatcher. There was it was not the liberal organization or Thatcher's organization that won the election. The uh, the Medicare strike through the Keep Our Doctors organization, which was very strong and and very well funded, uh, funded. A great deal. There was a lot of American Medical Association money came up, it carried over, and these groups of people were um, were organized were, were were organized into groups regardless of politics, with conservatives, social credit, liberal, all the all the people opposed to the government. It was easy for um, for Thatcher to use that organization, use the nuclei of that organization. To uh, as a stepping stone uh, to to uh, his party organization by promising rugged individualism and, and free enterprise, and those uh, those words are still uh, exactly the same today, uh, talk from 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 Tory quarters as they were from from Thatcher. Now that won uh, won the election very narrowly. You must remember that. 200 votes apportioned in eight constituencies uh, could have changed the election. Not 200 per, but 200 in, when we lost by uh, 17, 27, 
40, and so on, and add those up, those, those borderline constituencies. We, uh, we, had a, we just lost out. We had, lost, we had had eight constituencies going the other way. So it was a very narrow victory. Mm -hmm. And I know I was a cabinet minister at the time, and I, I found that I had, uh, I had uh, to be, in fact, I was covering, Mr. Brocklebank was sick at the time. I, I spent five days in my constituency, and that was the narrowest victory I ever had in the battle. Uh -huh. And you did win, though. And, I did uh, win. <laughs> Again, uh, we could talk about your success in that, uh, in that, in, in that uh, election. Why do you think you won? Uh, popularity or, or what? Well, I believe, I believe I won uh, because um, uh, this may sound uh, uh, immodest, but uh, I had, uh, I have always run on the basis that I, I never made a promise I didn't keep, and I never made a statement that I couldn't verify and back up. When I, the last election I ran, in the Battlefords in 1978, uh, I was able to say, put that on my masthead. I never, never made a promise I didn't keep, and I think there's no one in the Battlefords will will uh, will deny that. We because um, main, and that wasn't because of me. That was because of my party. Because when I when I went into a planning session, I I would always say, look. Let's find out what is possible to do, what it is possible to do in the battlefield. I don't want, I want, don't want nonsense, I want fights. And if it's possible to build a certain amount of road, to build the extension of a school, like our comprehensive uh, high school, if it's possible to do that, then we will put it in our platform. If it's possible to build a bridge, we've got the money for that, then we will put it in our platform. And if you, if, if, if you do that and the party backs you, which it always did for me, it makes, in my opinion, uh, an unbeatable combination. Mm -hmm. the, the opponent in that 64 election was uh, Mr. Herb Sparrow. Um, maybe we could talk about what kind of campaign he ran, a few comments on that. Well, it was the typical, it was the typical uh, uh, private enterprise campaign uh, on, the, on, the, on the back of bombastic the late bombastic Ross Thatcher uh, you know big business can do it better and uh, and of course the, uh, the uh, that has always been and continues to be the uh, the argument uh, they uh, they promise a lot promise of 80,000 jobs uh, was Yes, they promised 80,000 jobs, and at the end of Thatcher's seven years, uh, it was a total flop. In fact, we had lost close to 100,000 people. Our population had dropped in the last two or three years of the Thatcher, uh, the Thatcher government. Uh, they, uh, the same uh, situation would hold true today if it wasn't for the fact uh, that Alberta has uh, fallen on its face totally, and a number of people that had jobs in Alberta have come back to Saskatchewan, and most of them, when they come back, are going on unemployment insurance or social aid. Mm -hmm. And while you sat on the, in the opposition from 64 to 71, a few interesting incidents occurred, and, and one was this uh, polluted water issue, and maybe you can talk about that a bit. It's kind of funny. Well. The polluted water issue um, arose in, uh, in the winter of 67, 68, as I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, because uh, of the people who were in, in office at that time. Uh, the city of Edmonton and uh, some of the chemical plants on the outside of Edmonton were dumping raw sewage into the North Saskatchewan River. Uh, the uh, entrails from Gaynor's packing plant, uh, from the slaughterhouse, were going into the river. You could find human excreta at the bottom of the river all the way down to Fort Saskatchewan. It was so bad that the city of Edmonton and the Alberta government had to service Fort Saskatchewan 
which is uh, a city downriver from uh, Edmonton, had to service them with a water line which, uh, which uh, provided water from west of Edmonton uh, to directly by pipeline to Fort Saskatchewan. Uh, that was how bad it was. Well, it got so bad with chemicals and so on that uh, even with a good, fil reasonably good filtration plant in, in North Battleford, you could, you just simply could not uh, bear to, to cook or drink, uh, or even be in the, in the, almost be in the, in your home, with when you open the water taps, because of the uh, offensive odor that came from North Saskatchewan River water. I took a a jug of water down to the to the legislature and uh, in Saskatchewan and uh, before the orders of the day I had presented and placed a glass of, of water on each desk of both the government the liberal government members at that time and and the opposition and uh, said well here's what we we are getting out of our taps in North Battleford drink it if you dare. Uh, Senator, now Senator Stewart, was Minister of Health at that time, said he had been in touch with the Minister of Health in, in Alberta and uh, that something was going to be done, done about it uh, very soon. He had every assurance, etc. Well, I didn't believe him and uh, nothing was happening. So uh, I, uh, I decided to go to the source of the trouble. And uh, we took a couple of jugs of water. Alec Balich had uh, his, uh, was doing reporting at that time. He had his movie camera and sound equipment. Garrett and I hold, went along and uh, we went into the Alberta legislature. It happened to be the day that Mr. Manning, who was the Premier and Minister of Finance, was bringing down his budget. And uh, prior to the, to the uh, House opening, we were pouring drinks for everyone going in and out, uh, including the press. And uh, I managed to get the member for Banff Cochrane, who was an independent. Difficult to find anybody who wasn't in the government at that time. But this uh, old gentleman, a fine old gentleman, uh, sitting as an independent for Ben Cochran, he agreed that he would make the presentation and, and present my letter to the Premier and the Minister of Health, which simply said, look, we, uh, we don't like the garbage you're putting in the river, and uh, the quickest cure uh, that, uh, that we could have if, if by some dint of, of some magic we could reverse the Saskatchewan River and have it flow back through Edmonton and into your water supply for a few days. We wouldn't be very long in having legislation from your government to correct the situation. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Donable Do Donovan Ross said uh, that was a, he had no idea that, uh, that the situation was this bad, which uh, uh, contradicted our Minister of Health, Mr. Stewart's statement, but the sum, uh, to sum it up, it was only a few weeks afterwards when the situation changed very drastically and we no longer had the rotten water from Edmund. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, it isn't perfect by any means, but uh, the kind of pollution we had was cleaned up for the city, the, the packing plants, and uh, the city had to, was, uh, had to clean their clean up their act. Mm -hmm. and that was kind of a colorful approach to re resolving that issue. <laughs> but uh, there was another incident uh, with uh, highway signs at the, the Highway 5 bypass. Uh, you can recall that one. Yes, I, I certainly can recall that one. When, uh, uh, when the, uh, the government of the day, the liberal government of the day, uh, built the uh, the new bridge 
uh, the new the new Battleford Bridge, which is there today. Uh, they uh, they built the new highway in its present location over the hill, uh, which was sometimes uh, has, was known for a while as Dead Man's Crossing, a very wide right of way, and uh, a whole a population that had driven between Battleford and North Battleford, between Saskatchewan Hospital and North Battleford for years and years. Human beings are creatures of habit. And you can put up all the signs you like. Uh, if they're a little preoccupied, that crossing, and anyone can take a look at today, on the, on the brow of the hill, eastbound traffic coming up that hill at what was quite often at the, before the, the speed limits were put in at 75 miles an hour because it's trans-Canada traffic even if you stopped uh, on uh, uh, before you got to that intersection by the time a car showed up, you did not have time to come from a standing stop to cross that road. It was, it was physically impossible if that car was going even legal road speed to, uh, to, um, to get across that road. So we, uh, we had a situation where in less than nine months, in fact, the, 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 um, the road was only open for seven months, we had 37 cars wrecked, 22 people hospitalized, and three people killed at that intersection. Well, the Chamber of Commerce, the, uh, the city, city police, the RCMP, uh, city police, uh, the, the city council at that time were all complaining and saying something has to be done. And uh, I certainly was complaining as the member of the legislature. I drew it to the attention of the government and to the Minister of Highways. At that time, it uh, was, uh, was Dave Bolt. And uh, Dave Bolt was one of those very matter-of-fact, down-to-earth uh, old boys that said people should obey the law. The stop signs are there. They should obey them, period. And if they don't, then they're, I don't know, they get killed. That's all there's to it. Well, anyway, in April, while this house was in session, that was the second fatality. An old friend of mine, Frank Bryan, a rancher from Lizard Lake, south of the river, was, um, was hit. He and his wife tried to get across, coming from Battleford, and were hit by an oncoming car. And uh, Frank died a couple of days later in the hospital, and his wife was very badly hurt. She never really got over the, over it. At that time, I, I uh, told Dave Bolt, if he didn't do something about it, that I would. And uh, so things went along. And it was in, uh, I believe it was August of that year, a family from Winnipeg uh, was um, was uh, crossing the was, was heading for Saskatoon. A lady from Battleford tried to get across, and there was another serious accident. And the mother of two children was killed. Uh, the father and the two girls all were flown into uh, University Hospital with multiple fractures. And uh, that was on a Saturday, Sunday. I, uh, I went to work with a friend of mine, Stu Lister. I don't think he'd mind being mentioned. He didn't want to be mentioned at that time, but Stu Lister was helping me. I went to the co-op store and I got four by eight uh, plywood signs. I had uh, another chap paint them with a great big stop right in the, in the center. They, nobody could miss them. We made some smaller signs, 
further for further back, stop ahead 600 feet, which was a little further than what the regulations called for. We took post hole augers, we dug the holes, and uh, Stu stuck the stop ahead sign up on one end, I did the other. There's a pouring rain, I remember water running down the, my back. We were soaked. And then uh, we, uh, we set up the, the large stop sign and uh, put them in solidly, tamped them in. And I, I, uh, I remember with a real thrill, still do, when those big semis were, were, uh, were started to come in and you could hear them hit the air when, when they were all coming to a full stop for about 48, 48 hours. I sent a telegram to Ross Thatcher telling him what I had done and why I had done it. And uh, that... Uh, brought about the present arrangement, which at that time, I, I must admit, I didn't think was sufficient, but the fact is that in the number of years that, uh, that that's been put up, they narrowed the right of way, put up, put up the slow down to, uh, to uh, I think it's 50 km or something like that there now. And uh, there's been one fatality at that crossing, and and uh, that was an elderly lady who apparently was confused or something. She she should not have gone out. But that will happen at almost any intersection. Mm -hmm. A few of the ministers that time thought that uh, you should be charged for breaking the law, putting up those signs. Yes, uh, I, in fact, I think the, min the Mr. Bolt thought I should be charged, but uh, and I was wishing they would. I was I was hoping they would charge me, but. Uh, Davy Stewart and, and Ross Thatcher understand they had us uh, had raised it in cabinet. They decided that uh, that would have only strengthen my case, and they dropped it. They simply went to work and, and very very speedily put in the present uh, signing system, which has been effective. Mm -hmm. So now we're moving up into the the seventy one election where the uh, NDP under Alan Blakeney regained control, I guess you could say, and maybe we can talk a bit about that election and what happened there. Well, I, uh, I, uh, history, I suppose, tells us just about everything. The, uh, the, um, freewheeling, open for business policies of, uh, of Thatcher obviously had not worked. We, uh, instead of, of 80,000 jobs, we had uh, things getting to near depression stages. Uh, we uh, were going into debt, not nearly as rapidly as we, we are today or have gone today, but nevertheless, in other words, the bloom was off the, the uh, Thatcher Rose or the, the uh, open for business private enterprise rose at that time, which uh, uh, indicated that the public was not very happy. We won the election. I suppose that was the was more than 50% of the vote at that time. Um, Alan Blakeney was nominated as leader at that time. Um, how did that come about? Well, he was, Alan Blakeney was, uh, was, had been elected as leader uh, the, uh, about a year before. It was 1970. Uh -huh. And uh, that was uh, was after the resignation of Woodrow Lloyd, who had decided that he did not want to maintain the leadership uh, uh, any longer uh, for the for his own reasons. I uh, I was disappointed when when Woodrow stepped up because I want to say this clearly that Woodrow Lloyd was one of the finest people I've ever met. He was a good administrator. Uh, would have made would have made an excellent would have made an excellent preacher. He he did a marvelous job for the for the two years he was was premier. And uh, I think, in retrospect, if ever was a time when um, when he should have hung on, uh, you know, for an extra year uh, to allow the impact of the advantages of Medicare to have been felt properly 
we would never have lost that 64 election, even if he had waited till June, because every every day or week that went by, people of Saskatchewan were saying, hey, uh, these bills are being paid, my doctor's still here, what was all the fuss about? But uh, that we had not had enough time for the Medicare uh, uh, emotion to die down. Who was the uh, opposition candidate in that 71 election in North Battleford? In, in, uh, that was Roy Dean, former mayor. He was running Herb Sparrow, Herb Sparrow uh, ran again in 1967 and was defeated a second time. And that was when, when uh, they had not elected anybody. Uh, yeah, the Liberals didn't get a, a seat of any kind in northwest Saskatchewan. And Ross Thatcher decided he, uh, he was going to have a Liberal of some kind in a prominent position, so he appointed Herb Sparrow. As senator, it was it was Thatcher's recommendation that um, brought Herb Sparrow to the Senate. And so the seventy election, seventy one election, 71 election, was, election. R was Roy Dean. That's right. Roy Dean, and you won won that seat. Yes. And maybe we can uh, go over some of the uh, policies or uh, incidents that happened in from seventy one in those years that uh, sort of stand out in your mind? Well, I was, um, I was uh, I, uh, appointed in 1971. I was appointed as Minister of Natural Resources, which was, was my portfolio in the, in the Woodrow Lloyd government prior to 1964, and uh, also uh, in the Department of Co-ops. We, uh, we initiated a number of, of uh, programs in natural resources that uh, that first year, and that uh, and reestablished re uh, some uh, of the morale that was had been been lost in, in the department. We brought in uh, we brought in uh, initiated a, a number of uh, 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 programs which were were work programs in in the north. Uh, we. Uh, we established, we established uh, uh, sawmills and uh, and uh, coal mills in Isla La Crosse and Beauval and a number of other places. I was also uh, minister in charge of the uh, timber board, and we initiated a number of, uh, of uh, new programs there. We started the rebuilding and uh, revamping and modernizing of the sawmill at, at Big River. And uh, then we were also, at, the, at that time, the, the party had, had uh, promised that they would establish a department of northern Saskatchewan, which uh, uh, we did, we set up the machinery. And uh, it was decided then that the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Northern Saskatchewan, in order to merge the responsibilities, should be under one minister. And uh, uh, Ted Barman was given the responsibility for those two departments, and uh, the Premier asked me if I would take on the Department of Highways, which uh, was, uh, especially public relations-wise, was, uh, was not running as, as well as it should. And there were some new programs that, that we wanted to introduce there. The main program we brought in at that time was, was a program called Operation Open Roads and Operation Main Street. The program was designed to bring dust-free all-weather roads to every town and village off the main highways in Saskatchewan. And uh, what it did was was put about 240,000 people in Saskatchewan, small town and rural Saskatchewan, on uh, on dust-free roads, and uh, improved their main main street, uh, paved their uh, main street, and uh, we continued with that, with paying portions still do today, I believe, and uh, paying for the maintenance. 
which uh, which was a real a real shot in the arm for small town Saskatchewan. I was very proud of that program. You still, I, I still feel good when I see the Tiger Lily, the Community Access, which were initiated at that time. And, uh, and, uh, I don't know whether the the people of, of Saskatchewan, the rural people of Saskatchewan, really realize how much impact that program had on their pocketbook, those small towns of Saskatchewan, because if, um, if any person in Saskatchewan, for instance, Rabbit Lake, Saskatchewan, was the, was the, uh, we had the official opening of Operation Open Roads and Main Street, because it was the, it was the town that was the furthest distance from a main highway anywhere in Saskatchewan. And so we had the official opening there. And if the uh, people, the farmers and the people of, of Rabbit Lake were to, were to take out a pencil and paper uh, and, and figure out what um, three or four cents a mile on their car or truck would mean today, and that's what the difference between blacktop and gravel, would uh, not saying anything about the rocks in their windshield. Uh, if they figured that out on the trips, uh, uh, on the basis of even one trip into North Battleford per week, they would have enough money to pay for their license and their insurance any year, just in the saving, and to say nothing of the comfort and the safety of driving on a dust-free road. I'm sorry to say that the, that road to Rabbit Lake today is in a pretty sorry state of affairs. You, uh, you, uh, if they put a red flag at all the danger spots, they'd have more red flags there than the road to Moscow. So your years as uh, highways minister were probably quite successful. Um. Oh, yeah, that was that was only one that was only one program that we brought. We also brought in. We 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 had we had a had set up a a safety committee of legislators and under the chairmanship of Arthur Thiebaud. He brought in a report uh, in, uh, in the mid-70s that we known as the Thiebaud Report, and that is still, that is still a, a, uh, a book well worth reading on roads, road and traffic safety in Saskatchewan. Uh, we had, um, which recommended that, in, in one thing it recommended was uh, compulsory seatbelt legislation, which uh, I brought in in 1977, and uh, a number of other things which were done. Uh, we uh, Safety 77 program uh, was initiated, and uh, since that time, since that time, since the initiation of that, you can look at a chart of accidents, fatalities, serious injury in Saskatchewan from 77 the chart shows a, a drop a continual drop uh, and the number of lives saved by those safety programs unfortunately the, the, uh, there has not been the emphasis on uh, especially seat belts seat belts is the one singular thing that will save more more lives than any any other any other aid. If they the, the the millions of dollars that are being spent today on this lights on for life program, if the same emphasis have used that money to further uh, further uh, propagate the the safety seatbelt safety and a number of other things, it would be far better spent because the the lights on for life thing is a, is a, has been, in my opinion, a total waste of money. Go down any road today, and if you find, sometimes you find a, uh, you'll find a few lights on. But if you get one out of four lights on, uh, when you meet them, and I'm, I'm traveling the road into North Battleford every day, coming, coming in and out, you are going to be very fortunate. So it's a waste, it's a total waste of money. The only thing it does is give Mr. Russo a lot of publicity, uh, political publicity, and that is all. 
And if they did, now, I'm not suggesting that, that putting lights on is wrong. But what is needed, what we must do in, in the, in, with lights, is to simply subsidize a device that people, that lights automatically switch on and off when the, when the car is started into motion. And we should, be, we should be saying to the manufacturers, they have it on some cars now, a Cadillac or in some of the more expensive cars, the lights go on and off immediately. And they'll go off when, when, as soon as you turn your car off. That's the way it ought to be. Far better to subsidize a device that will, will, uh, will uh, and, and spend the money that way and make it compulsory. Because if you have, and, and anybody wants, and if, if, if this is, if my statement is going to be repeated as far as safety is concerned. When you do have uh, a number of cars lit up, there's a one car comes out from behind him. You 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 you're lulled into a sense of security that all of them have their lights on. The one car that comes out from behind those lights, you don't see it, and the the the, the whole the whole idea is self-defeating. If you don't have them all on, either they've all got to be on, or or or, or, or the thing is going to work in reverse. Leading up to uh, the eighties. I'm kind of interested to know what circumstances led you to decide to, uh, I suppose, retire from politics and uh, move on to other things. Well, my uh, the the the, um, the uh, decision I made was that uh, that I had I had put in uh, nearly thirty years of my life. A number of the things that I had wanted to see done had been accomplished. Certainly, the uh, the uh, uh, public ownership of the potash mines, which was a tremendous success, uh, our our, our uh, even even today, uh, our Sask Oil, our the, the other Crown Corp, Sask Oil, and uh, Saskatchewan Mineral Development are some of the best money makers that we have in, in, in spite of bad management. Uh, they, uh, potash, of course, is not, and that, uh, that is only, the only reason potash is not making money is because the government is deliberately allowing the private companies from the United States to, uh, to gain the markets that we should have, and markets that we had developed have been given away to the to the uh, to the private corporations however I uh, I uh, all of those things were were in place uh, we asked we, we, we demand that civil servants retire in fact I had had a number of letters from people who did not want to retire and saying hey you're over 65 uh, how come, uh, how come I have to retire and you don't? And uh, I've always been pretty, pretty concerned about things being fair. Uh, that, of course, was not the only reason. The other reason was that I had also seen a number of, of older politicians, for instance, uh, late John Diefenbaker, uh, stick around far longer than uh, than uh, they should have, and they'll be the point where where uh, people say, "For God's sake, why don't you realize that you're, you've you've had your day?" Uh, I didn't want to be in that position. Another thing that I uh, that I had always had in my mind, and I learned that from my late friend John Bracklebank Sr. I suppose was the money he said, look, if you any time a member is, has consistently held a seat for years and years and years, that seat becomes uh, pretty vulnerable when uh, all of a sudden he, he drops out of the picture. There have been some stellar examples of that uh, situation developing. The late John Diefenbaker uh, uh, was, was one of them. When he uh, when he finally 
uh, passed out of the picture. Uh, the uh, Prince Albert constituency immediately changed hands. My uh, good friend, the late Everett Wood, member for uh, Swift Current for a number of years, he, uh, he stepped out of the picture. Uh, we haven't held that seat since. Now, uh, we, uh, my strategy was that we would elect a member in between elections, get his or her feet on the ground, and, uh, and uh, they would be in a better position in a general election having, having built uh, a base, a political base. Well, all of that worked. Uh, we had uh, a first-class candidate in the Battlefords, David Minor, as far as I'm concerned, was and is one of the best minds in Saskatchewan. If, it, if I had to pick 10 people I know with a good mind, uh, a, a political judgment, certainly economic judgment, Dave Miner would have to be among the top 10, in my opinion. And uh, so I'm proud, I'm proud of the, the fact that, that he, he uh, got the no nomination. There were, there were, uh, were a couple of others. Uh, 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 Ken Holliday and, uh, and uh, Mr. Keithley, a school teacher from, that stood for nomination. Any of those people would have made, would have made good members as well. And I, I thought highly of all of them. However, the, uh, the situation that developed in 82 with a, a uh, you know, landmark political bribery with with um, removal of gasoline tax and subsidization, uh, subsidization of mortgages, um, and, and a generation that had grown up and uh, never really realized how well off they were, uh, all culminated in, in, a, in, a, in a disaster for, for us politically. And I don't think that uh, any, well, very few people survived it. Uh, it, it has been and uh, will go down in history as one of the most costly mistakes that the electorate of Saskatchewan has ever made. And uh, so going back to my retirement, I, I, everything I did, I did with a, with a reason. I have no regrets about my reasons. I simply say, I simply say, I, I was not a little, it was not a little, a little thing that struck my funny bone. I, I knew very well Grant Devine would have to run somewhere if there was a by-election, and uh, I knew very well he wasn't going to be running in the Battlefords. So when I retired, I said, well, we'll have two by-elections in Saskatchewan at least. Uh, some conservative will run in the Battlefords. Devine will run for cover somewhere else. And speaking about your own political career, uh, I guess we can't dispute dispute your popular popularity in the Battlefords, uh, this, this career that we said spanned 29 years. You've been well remembered, uh, Kramer Place, Kramer Campground. Mm -hmm. um, what would you like to remember by in your political career and uh, that type of thing? Well, what I'd like to be remembered by uh, was uh, the fact that, uh, that I, I uh, never made a promise that I didn't keep. I never, I never did anything during my course of uh, my political career that I'm not proud of. Uh, that may be, um, may be a little self-praise, but at the same time, uh, I, I, uh, I am the one that can say it because I'm the one that knows it. Uh, my family, my family has, uh, has been tremendous support. My wife Dorothy is, has been has been uh, a perfect teammate. She uh, was able to raise a family successfully uh, that we're very proud of. And uh, looking at all the other things, one could say 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 uh, pick pick dozens of things that we're proud of, but if you have to pick one thing, uh, I, would, I would say that, that uh, I, am, I am happy about uh, my 
political career. I, uh, it would not have been possible if I hadn't have been a part of the New Democratic and the CCF party, because it's still the only party in Canada that seriously considers its programs uh, before they announce them and seriously carries them out after they're elected. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Kramer.